And now I'd like to introduce our speaker, our next speaker, Dr. Zachary Elkin of Ophthalmology. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Ophthalmology and has a practice in pediatric ophthalmology and adult strabismus at the NYU Langone Eye Center. He did his medical training here at NYU School of Medicine. He went on to study ophthalmology at Stanford and then completed a fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. In addition to seeing patients with NF1, he works with children for, um, who have diverse eye problems from needing glasses to eye surgery for crossed eyes, cataracts, glaucoma, and trauma. Please welcome Dr. Elkin. Hello, everybody. Uh, again, my name is Zach Elkin. I'm a pediatric ophthalmologist here at NYU. Um, I'm here to talk with you all today about some of the common eye findings with, mostly with children, but also adults with uh, neurofibromatosis type one. Um, you know, all the, the women who have spoken today are the real experts. I'm just hoping to share a little bit about what I know and what are some of the things that you can all expect to see um, with eye findings and with an eye exam. Uh, so the real question is, why did they ask a pediatric ophthalmologist here to speak with you all today? A uh, few different reasons. Uh, first, eye exams can help make the diagnosis of NF1. Um, some of the diagnostic criteria that we'll talk about can be seen on an eye exam, and that can save you all from costly uh, genetic testing um, if we can make a clinical diagnosis. Uh, number two, particularly with children, children don't often know or can't express that they're having a problem with their vision. Um, and so it's important to do routine screenings to look for subtle signs of changes in vision and to help us uh, treat that so there isn't future vision loss. Uh, the third reason is that one of the most important complications of NF1 are optic pathway gliomas, and these are tumors of the nerve cells in, in the optic pathway. Um, and we no longer recommend routine screenings for these, so it's important that children, because these generally happen uh, in younger children, have routine screenings to make sure we're picking up subtle signs of vision changes and then can do the appropriate testing to make the diagnosis. And finally, I just want you all to know that, you know, in this area, there are a bunch of fantastic ophthalmologists, but not all ophthalmologists feel comfortable working with kids or understand all of the criteria and uh, the treatments for NF1. So it's important that whichever eye doctor you're seeing, you have good communication with them and you know that they feel comfortable uh, making the diagnosis and working with patients and families with NF1. And so again, what are the goals of screening? That's to help make the diagnosis of NF1 and, off, and to uh, look for subtle and early changes in vision so that we can start treatment if needed soon. And so generally, the screening uh, protocol that we like to do here is that when a diagnosis of NF1 or is made or if there's a suspicion for NF1, um, you guys should kind of leave that initial appointment with a referral to ophthalmology to get a baseline eye screening. Um, generally, the first year we'll do eye screening every six months if everything is looking okay, and then extend that out to an annual screening uh, until the age of eight, um, again, if everything is looking all right. After that, it sometimes can be a little bit less frequent, but we generally recommend doing an eye screening every one to two years to look for signs of vision change, changes. And one of the main things, again, that we're looking for are signs that uh, an optic pathway glioma may have developed, because if we do see any of those signs, then we can work with your NF1 doctors to order an MRI and, and really uh, make the diagnosis and any treatments that are needed. So what is a op uh, pediatric ophthalmologist looking for when you come in to the visit? Well, this is right here is a cross section of the eye. And starting over here on uh, your left is the cornea. That's kind of the outer clear level, uh, clear uh, outside of the eye. Behind that is the iris or the colored part of the eye. In the middle of the iris is the pupil, which lets light go to the lens. 
which is right behind the iris. It gets focused on the back wall of the eye, which is the retina. And in the retina, there are cells that take the information of this light and send it through the optic nerve to the brain to be interpreted. And various parts of this whole uh, eye and, and vision pathway can be affected by uh, NF1. So one of the first things we look for are Lisch nodules. Uh, Lisch nodules are these tiny microscopic bumps on the iris or the colored part of the eye. Oftentimes, they're too small to see just with the naked eye, so we use a special microscope called a slit lamp to look for them. And uh, there are slit lamps on chairs and also handheld ones for smaller children who can't fit uh, up to the larger size ones. And these Lisch nodules have no effect on vision, which is great, but are important to to diagnose because one of the clinical criteria for making the diagnosis of NF1 is having two or more Lisch nodules. Uh, Lisch nodules tend to become more common as kids get older. So by age three, only about 5% of kids will have Lisch nodules. By age five to 10, about 50% of kids will have Lisch nodules. But again, you know, having them, it helps make the diagnosis of NF1. You can also see on the list of criteria, there are other things that we can see on the eye exam that can help make the diagnosis of NF1. So plexiform neurofibromas can occur around the eye, these optic pathway gliomas, and also uh, skeletal changes around the orbit or the, the bones around the eye can also uh, occur in, in uh, kids with NF1. So I talked a lot about optic pathway gliomas, and again, these are tumors of the nerve cells uh, from the optic nerve going back into the brain. And here, just as an example of an MRI of a patient with an optic uh, pathway glioma in the right optic nerve, and so here's a cross section. You can see that this nerve right here is a lot bigger than this nerve right here, and that's because there is uh, a tumor in that uh, optic nerve. And so one of my main jobs is to look for clues that can, that can raise the suspicion for an optic pathway glioma. And so the thing, types of things that I'm looking for are signs of worsening vision, so a child not able to read as well on the vision chart, uh, decrease in color vision, shaking of an eye or nystagmus, crossing of the eyes or strabismus, or a decrease in peripheral vision, too, can be a sign of a problem with the optic nerve. We can also see different changes in the orbit, so eyes can become we call proptotic or look like they're pushing forward, um, and we can measure that in a clinic exam. Or we can see different changes in the actual appearance of the optic nerve. So when I dilate a child and take a look in the back of the eye, this is essentially what I see. This is a photograph, um, but back here, this is the retina, the back wall of the eye. These little uh, lighter circles here are the optic nerve as it enters uh, the eye itself. It has normal blood vessels coming out of it. And the center part right here is the macula, and this is where we have our finest vision. Um, and so different changes when I look in can raise suspicion for optic pathway gliomas. So some of the things that we can see is swelling of an optic nerve. So this is a different uh, patient right here, but you see this, this nerve right here compared to this nerve is a lot larger. The borders are a little bit hazier or fuzzier, and it almost has that appearance like it's popping out at you because it's swollen. You can also see a change in the color, or the nerves can become pale. And again, this nerve right here is a lot whiter in color than this nerve right here. And these are another chain, uh, signs of some changes or damage to the nerve. And we can all see, the, you know, you can physically see this on a dilated exam. I also want everyone to know that. All kids of any age can have their eyes examined. So you're never too young to have your eye examined, but it must be done in an age-appropriate way. Um, so you know, the main thing that we're going to do is check vision. So older kids can, the way we check vision is have them read the eye chart, which probably many of you have done. Um, usually at age five or six, they'll be pretty comfortable with their letters to be able to read the chart. Sometimes in younger kids, we can use a limited number of letters. We use the letters H, O, T, and V with special charts to, you know, because they may not know all the letters. And we can have them speak and say which letters they're seeing or even match to a sheet of paper. And so we can see how small 
uh, you, you know, you project a small letter up on the screen and they have a little piece of paper and they point to whichever letter they see. And so with that, you know, very young kids can actually read the chart. We also have other charts with pictures on it. So a kid might not know a letter, but they may be able to recognize the different pictures of different sizes, and that can give us a sense of how well they're seeing. And younger kids, even age two or three, can, can be able to read this type of chart. And finally, we can even get a sense of how uh, babies, you know, just a few months old, are seen with different techniques. This is what we call a teller acuity card here. And this is a giant uh, cardboard board that has one side with stripes of different sizes and a different side that's blank. And if you hold it up to a child, they're going to clearly look to the side that has the more interesting stripes on it, not the blank side. And we can show them cards of different sizes stripes getting smaller and smaller. And from that, we can actually measure how, uh, how, how fine their vision of how small the lines they can see. And so this is something that we can do in the clinic as well, and even uh, children that are very, just a few months old. Um, eye exams, compared to a lot of doctor's exams, can be really annoying and frustrating. They're long. You're usually in the eye appointment for hours. And we apologize for that. We wish it would be faster ourselves. Um, but that's because an eye exam really needs to be comprehensive. So when you take your child to get an eye exam, they should check vision like I had just talked about. If the child's old enough to check their color vision, check their visual fields or their peripheral vision because that can be a sign of, of early changes in the optic nerve. You should have a measure, they sh you know, you can, you can measure how uh, bulging out an eye is if there's any bulging there. You should have a check of the eye movements and the alignment of the eye and check the front of the eye with a slit lamp to look for Lisch nodules. And most importantly is to do a dilated eye exam. The drops we use for kids to dilate their eyes are a little bit stronger than we use for adults, so that, and they take a little bit longer to work. So you know it's a minimum of a half an hour waiting just for the drops to work, and their eyes can stay dilated for longer than the adult drops. Um, but that's because it's really necessary to take a good look at the nerves in the back of the eyes, and importantly, check for glasses prescription. Um, so in older kids, we can use what we call a four-opter to measure glasses, probably many of you have used. But even babies, we can check for a glasses prescription using different techniques. And I can't tell you how many kids I've seen that with a history of NF1 and all of a sudden the vision is getting worse in one eye, and it turns out it's just because they need a pair of glasses. And that's a much better diagnosis to walk out of an eye clinic, just needing glasses, than concern for an optic pathway glioma. Um, we have different technologies that we can use as well. So this is a picture of a, a visual field, and this is an automated machine that can show different spots in your peripheral vision of different sizes, and we can map out actually how well um, the perf your peripheral vision is. And uh, kids, even into their you know around 10 years old, can start to do these these tests, and this can be helpful for again for early signs of uh, peripheral vision loss. A great technology, which is coming, becoming more and more common in pediatric eye practices, but it's been around for a while in adult practices, is we call optical co coherence tomography, or OCT. And what OCT is, it's a, a light laser that kind of scans the retina and the nerve tissue and can measure to even the layer of the cell how thick the tissue is. And we can take measurements around the optic nerve to actually quantify or measure how healthy the nerve is in the back of the eye. And again, changes in this can be a sign that there might be changes uh, due to an optic pathway glioma. And so there really is no perfect test. As I spoke to a lot of family members today, oftentimes uh, diagnosis is made with uh, lots of visits and seeing lots of specialists because there is no perfect test. Um, and we need to put all this information together to make the right diagnosis. Um, even with a known diagnosis of an uh, optic pathway glioma, you can sometimes get growth of that on an MRI, but not having any different changes or any effect on their vision, and therefore treatment may not be necessary. Sometimes these can just be watched. But the reverse is true too. Sometimes an MRI can show that things are nice and stable, but we're seeing changes in vision that may warrant treatment. Um, and so we really need to use all this information together to appropriately treat and diagnose um, kids. And so again, when, uh, make sure whatever ophthalmologist you're working with, and there are tons of great ones in the New York City area, make sure they're comfortable examining kids. 
Make sure they understand the screening guidelines and will follow your child closely. Make sure they have access to the proper technology or at least can uh, refer your child to a place with proper technology. And most importantly, make sure they have good communication with your NF1 doctor. Um, these decisions are not made by an ophthalmologist alone. They're made with discussions between the ophthalmologist, NF1 doctors, and the family. And uh, that's really important that we can communicate well with each other. So, um, you know, ophthalmology is going to be a big part of your family's lives. And uh, we're here to help with, with anything you need. Thank you.